Hi class, I hope that you're all doing well. We're now in our fourth unit in this course, and this particular unit is going to be covering chapters 8, 9, and 10. And those are the chapters that are going to be on the final exam. So we're now in part two of middle adulthood. And in this particular video, we're going to be exploring cognitive development during this stage of life. In this video, you're going to be learning about crystallized and fluid intelligence. You'll also learn about research from a study called the Seattle Longitudinal Study. And this was a study where researchers track cognitive skills as people age. You'll learn about the importance of something called flow in contributing to creativity and life satisfaction, and the importance of leisure to mental health and successful retirement. Researchers have identified areas of both gain and loss in cognition as people move through middle adulthood. Cognitive ability and intelligence are often measured using standardized tests and validated measures, as you learned about in earlier modules. Two particular types of intelligence have been identified, and these are called fluid and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence refers to information processing abilities like logical reasoning, remembering lists, spatial abilities, and reaction time. Crystallized intelligence encompasses abilities that draw upon experience and knowledge. Measures of crystallized intelligence can include things like vocabulary tests, solving number problems, and understanding texts. And there's a general acceptance that fluid intelligence decreases continually from the later 20s onward, but that crystallized intelligence continues to accumulate. So one might expect, for example, to complete the New York Times crossword more quickly at 48 than at 22, but the capacity to deal with novel information declines. This is an image that was taken from your textbook, and this shows changes in fluid and crystallized intelligence across the lifespan. You'll notice that crystallized intelligence, again, the accumulated knowledge that one gains throughout life, continues to increase, and fluid intelligence, the capacity to find new ways of solving problems and perform, it begins to decline at around 30 years of age. One of the most influential perspectives on cognition during middle adulthood is a study called the Seattle Longitudinal Study of Adult Cognition. And this began in 1956, and it still continues. And what researchers have found is that decreases in cognitive abilities begin in about the sixth decade, and they gain increasing significance from that point on. I should point out, though, that there are researchers who suggest that there are small cognitive declines that begin as early as age 45, and that there is some evidence that adults should be as aggressive in maintaining their cognitive health as they are their physical health during this time, as the two are intimately related. This is an image from your textbook that shows you the changes in various cognitive abilities as we age. And you'll notice that the sharpest declines in all of these happen at about the age of 70 and after. So we see declines in verbal ability and inductive reasoning and verbal memory, spatial orientation and numeric ability and perceptual speed. There are many things though that older adults can do to delay this decline. This involves of course healthy eating and getting physical activity because we know that diet and exercise are intimately related to cognitive health. In addition, keeping one's mind active can really help in staving off this decline. An important concept in psychology and one that you read about in your textbook is something called flow. Flow is the mental state of being completely present and fully absorbed in a task. Think of a time when you've been able to block outside distractions. Your mind has been completely open to what you're doing. You felt a sense of intellectual satisfaction from this particular activity or from accomplishing the goal that it's related to. You probably noticed as you thought about this time that you weren't concerned with extrinsic rewards, but you were instead motivated by the internal feeling that you experienced when you had this experience of flow. Flow is an important part of feeling a part of something greater than oneself. And it's, imp it's an important part of curiosity. 
It's also described as the height of enjoyment. And the more a person experiences flow, the more that they tend to view their lives as being gratifying. The qualities that allow for flow are very well developed in middle adulthood. So we see many more opportunities for one to experience flow during this stage. In 1954, a researcher named Michael Pagliani identified a concept that's called tacit knowledge. He argued that each person has a huge store of knowledge based on life experience, but that it was often difficult to describe, to codify, and thus transfer, as stated by his famous quote, we always know more than we can tell. Organizational theorists have spent a lot of time thinking about the problem of tacit knowledge. So think about someone you've encountered who's extremely good at what they do. So the problem here with tacit knowledge is that it's really difficult to identify exactly what it is that makes someone who has tacit knowledge really good at what they do. So this particular person may have no more or less education, formal training, and even experience than others who are supposedly at an equivalent level. So what is that something that they have? That's the question, and it's difficult to really get to the root of that. Tacit knowledge is highly prized, and older workers often have the greatest amount, even if they're not conscious of that fact. Let's now take a moment to look at leisure time. It's interesting to think that this is an area of research, but it actually is. And the reason that it is is because it's so important for one's mental health. So what do you do in your free time? And how do you think what you do relates to your feelings of life satisfaction? Leisure activities can have an effect on physical health, whether it be the negative effects of watching a lot of TV or the positive effects of engaging in physical activity. So we can think of leisure activities as being related to self-care, which are behaviors and activities that are ultimately dedicated to increasing one's well-being. To provide you with perspective on leisure time, it's really interesting for us to think about how leisure time is connected to vacation time or paid time off. And so we see a problem here in the United States in contrast with many other countries where we see that in the US, we don't have very much paid time off. It's not mandated by law. So we can see here in this particular diagram that in contrast to other developed countries in the world, that the US is actually the only advanced economy that doesn't guarantee its workers any paid time off. So as a result, a quarter of the US's private sector workers don't receive any paid time off at all. And again, this is a chart that shows you that the amount of paid time off workers have in various countries around the world varies substantially. But we can see here that it's very low in the United States. And of course, we know that in the United States, it's not mandated by law. This particular data is coming from a source called Statista. And this is a great resource that you can find online with lots of interesting data. So if you're doing any a research project or a presentation, this is a great place to get information. So you'll note here in this particular chart You'll note that in the US, there are 10 public holidays, but those aren't paid off for many people. And compare that with other countries in this chart, where you'll see countries like the UK with 28 days of paid annual leave and nine public holidays, and Israel with 11 paid days of annual leave and 10 public holidays. So as we think about middle adulthood and the importance of being able to have time to do the things that we enjoy, and the connection between this and good mental health, we can think about why we may fall short. So you can see how difficult this can be for people to have leisure time for about 25% of the population who doesn't have paid leave. This is a chart that was taken from your textbook. And what it does is it shows you the proportion of time that people spend in different activities. So if you look at this chart, you can see that there is a very significant amount of time spent watching TV 
in contrast to other activities. So uh, other activities might include things like sports and exercising, socializing, reading, or just relaxing and thinking. But as much TV as people are watching and as quick as we may be to look at that and say, oh my goodness, this is so unhealthy, certainly we do benefit from more variety in life than just simply watching a lot of television. But I do think it's important to note that people do need to engage in self-care. And sometimes people do find that television can be an escape from the stressors of work and other responsibilities. But keep in mind that when someone's watching TV, they are being sedentary and so they're not getting the physical activity that they need. They're not getting those social interactions that we know are so beneficial to our health. And we know too that when people are watching a lot of television, we know that they may be more inclined to overeat or to eat unhealthy food. And TV has a way of affecting people's moods. And oftentimes it can be negative, especially if we think about how when we watch television, we might compare our lives to those of other people. We might see, for example, other people whose lives look less stressful or who have more resources or whatever it might be. So sometimes television, although it can be an escape, it can result in some negative feelings. We also know too that when people are doing things like just relaxing and thinking, that they're taking time to slow down. And we know how important it is to be mindful if we think about the effects of this on physical health, we can think about the benefits of things like yoga or meditation and how we can connect this to relaxing and thinking. So what have you learned about in this video? Well, in this video, you learned about crystallized versus fluid intelligence. And you also learned about research from the Seattle Longitudinal Study where researchers tracked cognitive skills as people aged. You learned about the importance of flow in contributing to creativity and life satisfaction. And you also learned about leisure and what people tend to do with their leisure time and the relationship between leisure and mental health. What will you be learning about next? Well, in our next video, which is part three of three, you're going to be learning about psychosocial development during middle adulthood. You'll also learn about concepts like Erickson's seventh stage of development that he called generativity versus stagnation, where the focus becomes on giving back to the next generation, whether it be through what, what one might pass on to their children or teaching or mentoring or volunteering. You'll also learn about the myth that surrounds the concept of the midlife crisis and the sources of stress that typically confront adults in midlife. You'll learn too about how men and women are uniquely affected by middle adulthood and the role that religion plays during this stage of development. Before we leave, I'd encourage you to think about yourselves. How do you hope to live your life when you're in middle adulthood? What will you do to promote a sense of life satisfaction? And for students in this stage right now, what do you think you can do to increase your sense of life satisfaction during this stage? I'd encourage you to take a look at your textbook and to look at those factors that are related to positive and healthy aging. And for each of you to think about these factors. As always, if you have any questions after watching this video or reading your textbook, please don't hesitate to reach out to me.